Welcome to the 2023 Saltwater Sportsman National Seminar Series, filmed on location at the IGFA and brought to you by Bass Pro Shops and Mako Boats. You're about to learn from teams of some of the top saltwater fishing pros and how you really glean the most from the Saltwater Sportsman Seminar Series is listen for the little subtleties, the small things that we are doing to put together a great catch or to get a few fish when times are tough out there. So let's get right down to it and start off the Saltwater Sportsman National Seminar Series. Coming to you from the IGFA in Fort Lauderdale, Florida, it's the Saltwater Sportsman National Seminar Series, brought to you by Bass Pro Shops and Mako Boats. Get ready, everybody. Here's George Poveromo. You're watching the Saltwater Sportsman National Seminar Series filmed at the IGFA and brought to you by Bass Pro Shops and Mako Boats. We're gonna talk about weather patterns and fish. And we have Dr. John Steiglitz here, who is not only a, an accomplished offshore angler out of South Florida and the Bahamas, but with the background of fisheries and marine biology. So we're gonna play off of him in terms of fishing, but as well as a scientific explanation, if one exists, for some of the topics that we're gonna bring up. Corey Crochetier hails out of Connecticut, fishes the entire New England range from New York all the way up. An expert when it comes to catching bluefin and yellowfin tunas on artificials and light tackle, the same with trophy striped bass. and. Seminar Series regular out of Tampa, the one, the only, Captain Mike Goodwine. And Mike, it's gonna be a very intriguing session and I promise you we will not talk Spanish mackerel or as you call them, dang fish in your part of the world. Weather patterns and fish, and I'm gonna throw this one out because we know how weather affects fish and I'd like to see if we can't get a scientific explanation. And even though it's a saltwater seminar, what I found in relation to freshwater fishing, I play a little bit with Central Florida bass, and I've noticed the times that I've done this, when a front starts to come in, that wind starts going west in our area, and before it actually goes northwest to where the actual front comes down, that these fish just chew. And I've caught some of my largest bass on that southwest to west, and numbers of them, but once that front comes in, it goes northwest, and it blows north, and goes northeast, nothing short of a DuPont lure, which is DuPont stick of dynamite, are gonna bring those fish up. So I noticed that with a lot of the saltwater fisheries too. And I'm gonna start off with you. What is it with a pressure gradient like that, that the fish will feed heavily, or some species before a front, and just shut down when a front comes in? How, how do you explain that? Well, they know what's coming, right? So fish in their habitat, they want to be comfortable, right? So they want to be able to do basic things, eat, reproduce, be comfortable, right? And so when they see that, when they can feel that front coming in, whether it's the wind direction, temperature, the barometer, right? In terms of the pressure change, that's something where it tells them, okay, it's about to get cold here, about to get unpleasant. And so they're going to feed heavily before then, knowing that once that cold weather comes in, it's gonna shut things down probably. And, and I've noticed that a lot with, um, seems like the bottom fish uh, tend to do that a good bit too. And it doesn't seem like all the species, is there any relation, for example, when that front comes in, uh, our area, especially during the season, the sailfish really pick up. And you get those fronts coming in and the nastier the better, and they seem to come on strong, as do the king mackerel. Certain species, they all have their different preferences, uh -huh. right, and their different lifestyles, and so, Sailfish, you mentioned, right? When that front comes through, as soon as that wind starts coming out of the northern quadrants, right, pushing against the Gulf Stream, that's gonna bring a sailfish up and we start seeing some of those tailing conditions. Right, right. And sure. so they're utilizing that wind coming out of the north, the wave action to push south, right? They don't wanna be in that, they wanna move away from that cold weather. They're using that weather pattern to help them move in a southward direction. Sure. It can also be from an energetic standpoint, some folks, you know, you hear them talk about that a fish, when the current's moving very strong towards the north, right, if we have a strong Gulf Stream current, sailfish are pushing against that, they're using a lot of energy. So if they come up on the surface or swimming against it, right, they may feed more heavily. We see that bite turn on because they're using a lot of energy, so. Interesting, and the king mackerel seem to be, uh, when you get those fronts, tend to be a little bit more aggressive too. Is, 
Right. So Same with Emmerer. You know, every fish has its own sort of optimal temperature. Sure. Right. And so different temperature conditions and pressure conditions can sort of impact that and turn certain species on versus others off. You're watching the Saltwater Sportsman Seminar Series. We're coming right back at you after a few commercials. The Saltwater Sportsman National Seminar Series is brought to you by Simrad. Go with Simrad and go with confidence. Penn, let the battle begin. Roths, comprehensive oceanographic analysis for fishing. Mercury Outboards, go boldly. Angle, portable fridge freezers and high performance coolers. George will be right back. Welcome back to the Saltwater Sportsman National Seminar Series from the IGFA in Fort Lauderdale, Florida. Brought to you by Bass Pro Shops and Mako Boats. Let's get right back to George. You're watching the Saltwater Sportsman National Seminar Series brought to you by Mako Boats and Bass Pro Shops. We're filming this on location at the IGFA. All right, Corey, you're up there, you do the tunas and you do a lot of the offshore stuff as well. How does weather pattern affects either the tunas or the bass. I mean, give me an example. Is there a contrasting between the two or is it generally the same? Let us know what's happening up there. Very big contrast between the two. Typically speaking, uh, with a striped bass inshore, they're much more affected by the weather patterns. And when I say that, I mean like, if you have a front coming in, they'll bite really good right till when the front is basically changing, whether it's either decreasing or if it's increasing barometer, right? They'll, they'll bite really good through that. When it starts to steady off, that's usually when you stop getting the more consistent bites. So it's a fluctuation. As long as it's fluctuating, they're gonna be feeding. Exactly, So yes. is that like the same case I gave that um, analogy early on with those largemouth bass feeding before the front, once the front comes that they shut? Yes, exactly, yeah. Oh, okay, now how is it with the tunas? Is it any different? No, it's, Same it's, deal there? it's very similar in the fact that they, they will bite better through a change in the front, but we always say tunas always bite good in the slop. So if it's really nasty out, so like if you're in the middle of a front, it's still real heavy conditions, you know, and you've got a, a dropping barometer, you got a lot of wind, a lot of wind chop and a lot of, you know, churned up water. Those fish actually bite better in that condition as well. I right, said, so Mike, let's go over to your area, you know, Tampa, you're a stook master, redfish pro, the whole bit. Now, that area, obviously, you, it, it, those fronts come roaring down in there, and you're dealing with a snook that it's a little bit on the northernmost of the range in your area and beyond. They're there and they're solid. How do you feel the weather patterns affect, say, snook? And is it different between snook and reds? Do the reds hang in there better with the cooler? Give me an idea what's happening on your side with weather patterns. Yeah, so snook hate cold weather. Um, the redfish bite all year long, the snook. Once it gets cold, they leave. They go up in the creeks, try to find the warmest spots. Um, I found out, like, right before the front, like he said, they'll eat their face off, trying to prepare or whatever. Uh, and then during the front, like, whenever the bite shuts down, when it shuts down for us, it's just dang and it's aggressive. We still have to catch them. We have to cut bait or fish it on the bottom and uh, just let them kind of like ease up and sit on it and grab it or whatever. But whenever, right before the front, you throw anything out there moving, they'll chase it down. So I guess they metabolism slow down when the water get a little colder. I ain't a doctor. I think I read that on Google. <laughs> I think I try to do a little study on this, but I just know we have to slow the presentation down a lot. All right, well, uh, let's stick to your specialty fish here. Uh, and Snook, and I'm gonna put redfish in there as well. All right, they get lethargic, they'll shut down pretty much during that front, you still catch them. Now, when do you see them starting to get that spark back again? How many days after a front, is, does the wind go back to the east? Is a slight warming trend that brings them back or do they stay lethargic for several days? Well, it's the warming trend. As Soon as that water temperature gets up a little warmer, it's like somebody flip a light switch and, um, and then it's different areas, uh, like up in the creeks, like I was telling you, where so we got real muddy bottoms, and when that, our tires are dropped real low, especially around this time of year, and it heats up that muddy bottom. So uh, they'll move up in the creeks, and then when that water come back in, it's, it's warm in there. So even during the, the fronts, the farther you go in the creeks, they still will eat. So I. I'm guessing it's all about the water temperature as far as everything else, you I know. I definitely suspect that. 
And what's also rolling in right now are, is a commercial break. But we're going to come right back to this. You're watching the Saltwater Sports National Seminar Series. How weather patterns influence fishing. We'll be right back for a few commercials. The Saltwater Sportsman National Seminar Series is brought to you by Rapala, your best shot at a world record. Suffix, always use the best line. VNC, your expert in hooks. Williamson Lures for the Pelagic Playground. Starbright, blending technology with performance since 1973. George will be right back. Welcome back to the Saltwater Sportsman National Seminar Series from the IGFA in Fort Lauderdale, Florida. Brought to you by Bass Pro Shops and Mako Boats. Let's get right back to George. Welcome back to the Saltwater Sports National Seminar Series, How Weather Influences Fishing with our panel. I'm working with Tampa's Mike Goodwine. Going back to what you were saying, when these snook in your area, they go in there to try to get the metabolism up and, and get that muddy bottom, absorbs the sunlight and the heat. And it's the same with these big trout, too, that if you go to zones, um, especially if you see docks that have these large boats sitting in them, mm -hmm. and if it's relatively shallow there, that these inboards kick out a little bottom. You might go down maybe a few inches, but there's like a little depression there. And if it's mud, it tends to also hold the warmth. And pitching live baits into those little holes under these docks where these larger boats are sometimes works really well for the for the trout. Yeah. The big ones as well. Yeah, and in, in anywhere where it's the seawall too, because that concrete would hold heat and radiate it towards the water. Uh, a lot of people don't know that. Uh, this time of year, we fish the the holes up under the docks, like you say, when the outboard kicking them out. And uh, it's usually a muddy bottom in the seawall. And that's what keeps the water warming in there. And uh, me personally, when it comes to fronts and people, some people go fishing off of, oh, I think a front gonna come or I ain't going because they're gonna shut down. I'm going anyway, because if I stay home, my old lady going to put me to work, <laughs> and I'm going to be doing something I don't want to do. So I, I normally I fish through the front, after the front, during the front. I, I don't judge my decision on if, if I'm going or not because of a front. So, And then I also learned that's when you become a better, better angler is when you go when it's at, the, at its worst. And if you could get them to eat, then you have to figure out stuff to make them eat. But well, most people just wanted to be game on instead of. Uh, and, and Mike, I know that you were huge in freshwater bass fishing. Mm -hmm. And I'm just going to get real quick. I just want an answer because when those bass shut down, when I play with those largemouth, you can't get them a strike during a cold front. Just give me one quick tip how I can make them eat. Cash net, I guess. <laughs> no, no, well, sure. You're about as hair, bad as Harry Vernon. We're yeah. going to leave that one now. I'm going to circle back to you, Corey. How are you fishing him differently to try to get a few fish to react on that? How, what are you doing as far as tactics to change that up? Uh, presentation. you got to slow it way down. Well, you, give me an example. Um, you have to, a lot of times, if the, the current is working in your favor, you can just drop your, um, uh, your lure size down a little bit so that way if you're fishing on the bottom, you can keep your bait down in the target zone and work it a little bit slower. If you need to, also, if the tide is pushing you, if you feel like it's sweeping you over a drifted spot and you're moving too fast, you might have to get on your, uh, you know, have somebody stay on the wheel and bump the boat in gear to slow it down a little bit so your drift isn't as fast. You know, if you're pushing a three knot drift, you know, you might be blown over the spot and your presentation might be horrible. Your bait not, might not be in the spot it needs to be for a long enough period of time for these lethargic fish to be able to react on it. All right, uh, John, let's go back to some of the offshore pelagic, or even inshore, is uh, you, when a big thunderstorm moves in and you see it coming in, sometimes you get a good bite, then you're hunkered down, you're worried about the rain, and then when the rain passes, that bite picks up again. What is it with a storm that triggers a feeding blitz, whether it's on the front side of it or on the back side of it? Well, a lot of it deals with temperature, right? And so if you're in a hot summer day, say you're on the flats, right, or in shallow water, and it's really hot there, right? Fish aren't going to be very comfortable, that sort of thing. You get a storm that rolls in, it's going to cool that surface water down. Okay. okay? And so then perhaps you create a scenario where they're going to be feed more actively, you're going to be in a more comfortable water temperature. Same thing offshore, right? And so we've seen this happen, you know, middle of the day, the summer doldrums, right? Mahi gets too hot at the surface. So we'll be down a little deeper, get storms rolling in, gets a little cloudy, 
right? Rain cools off the surface of the water. All of a sudden, you can cool that down and bite can turn on. We're gonna come back to weather patterns and fishing after a few commercial breaks. You're watching the Saltwater Sportsman National Seminar Series. The Saltwater Sportsman National Seminar Series is brought to you by Atlas Tracks, satellite tracking of recreational pleasure boats, supply vessels, and fishing fleets. Columbia Sportswear, stay cool and protected while fishing. JL Audio, ahead of the curve. ACR, building survival products since 1956. Florida Keys and Key West, visit FLAKeys.com. George will be right back. Welcome back to the Saltwater Sportsman National Seminar Series from the IGFA in Fort Lauderdale, Florida. Brought to you by Bass Pro Shops and Mako Boats. Let's get right back to George. Welcome back to the Saltwater Sports from the National Seminar Series, How Weather Patterns Affect Fishing. And I'm working with Dr. John Stieglitz. We were just talking about how fish tend to turn on when a thunderstorm moves in, and then again, once it passes. And you feel it's more of a cooling of the surface water than any kind of a pressure gradient change? I do, and I also think it can affect sort of in terms of the contrast, what they see. If all of a sudden it's a bluebird day and, and you get a storm that rolls in, that's gonna change the vision aspect of what they're seeing, right, if they're out there hunting. So can definitely the light levels can play into that. Understood, and you go back to that prefrontal condition and another species which could tear the bottom of the boat out when you get that west, southwest to west wind, right before that front, Wahoo. Right. And if you could time that to where you're out there wahoo fishing, and during that period there, before the front comes in, those wahoo just go on a big time chew. It's one of the best times to you know fish for them. Some of your experiences, uh, John, with your fishing, be it bottom fishing or offshore trolling, that maybe we've not touched upon here on how weather patterns might influence a bite or, or trigger a bite. Yeah, well, I think it's all about trying to think like a fish, right? So if you know that bad weather's coming, right? It's right before we're in South Florida. We know a hurricane's coming. What do people do? They go stock up on supplies, right? They so should be with, out fishing. Right, exactly. So if the, you know, the fish knows something's coming, then unpleasant conditions, they're going to go sort of start feeding heavily, right? Because they know that they're going to be hunkered down during those cold weather conditions. Well, can I take, uh, since we got a doctor here? Yes. Uh, uh, the magic question I always, always had, how come the fishing always sucks? on bluebird skies. Well, it's usually cold on those days, yeah. right? Yeah. And so it's very bright, it's cold, there's been that sudden change, so they really haven't adapted. A lot of times, you know, we talked earlier, you guys were talking about the eddies and a longer time that an eddy is there, mm -hmm. the more time the fish has sort of adapted to that, found that, mm -hmm. and so with fish, when it's cold, it's probably outside of its optimal temperature zone, right? Okay. And so those days, Usually not the best. Okay, so I'm glad I'm asking you that because I use that as an excuse for my clients, blueberry skies, so y'all heard the doctor. Right. <laughs> That's why they ain't biting. <laughs> oh, here's, it's somewhat weather related, but if not, I'm gonna put it in that category. Moons. Here, okay, is it true that when they say, well, you got the full moon, the fish feed at night, and they, then they're filled up, and they're not gonna feed as well during the day. Is that an old myth or? What, what, what could you tell me about full moons and, and fish? I think when it comes to mahi fishing, particularly, fishing on the full moon is, uh, I've never had great luck on the full moon, right? In the days leading up to it, the week leading up to it, uh, it's been dynamite fishing. Right? Now, why do you suppose that is? I mean, because it, they're it, feeding throughout the night. So, so you believe that, that that's really, Absolutely. it was just not an old tale. Cut, that's cut really... some mahi open that you catch yeah. early in the morning, yeah. on the full moon bite. And you tell me what's in their stomach, right? So that's something that we definitely see out there. But, you know, mahi eat all the time. So you can still have great days during a full moon. Again, there's always caveats to all of these sort of sure. rules and old wives' tales. Yeah, and a lot of those uh, geographic uh, right. subtleties And it's a puzzle, too. right? At the end of the day, you're putting together a puzzle. So you mentioned earlier about the fronts, right? That's one piece of the puzzle. The water temperature, the moon. These are all different pieces of the puzzle. The key is putting them together in a way that's going to give you your best shot at getting the bites. Absolutely. Corey, the moon in your fishery, uh, be it bass or tuna, 
you know, you heard the discussion we had. Does that apply to you as well up there? It does. With the bluefin, it seems to be um, very much so. The It's just like John was talking about. On a full moon, we tend to kind of shy away from saying, all right, we're going to do our top water trips those days. We don't want, really want to focus on that. Those fish seem to be a lot deeper. Um, like he was saying about stomach contents, a lot of times during the moon or like just before the moon, if you open these fish up, a lot of times you find squid in them. And the squid is in our area is always on the bottom, you know, in the 30 fathom range. So that has a lot to do with it for sure. Gotcha. Mike, we're down at about 15, 20 seconds left. I'm going to let you close this session out for good or bad. What are you going to say to wrap this up? <laughs> well, I mean, with, with the moon, I've, I've caught a bunch of fish doing a full moon and I've had b bad days. So I just... It's always good to use it as an excuse. You know, it's a full moon. That's why we ain't, we ain't caught none. Same with the bluebird skies. Bluebird skies. So. Always count on Captain Mike Goodwine to put a perfect <laughs> ending together. Uh, appreciate the panel here, Corey and uh, John and Mike. That was the Saltwater Sports and National Seminar Series. We're coming right back with a totally different topic. There you have it. The Saltwater Sports from the National Seminar Series will be right back next week with a totally different episode. If you want a chance to win our Super Grand Prize Mako 17 Pro Skiff Center Console, powered by Mercury Outboard, enter the drawing at nationalseminarseries.com. One lucky winner will take home this beautiful Mako boat. Best of luck. <laughs>